Hello, welcome back to the Replatform podcast. It's myself, James Gurn, and I'm joined as always by my co-host, Paul Rogers. How you doing, mate? Good, thanks. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm slowly adjusting to us doing this by video now as well, to put videos onto our YouTube channel and, and make sure I don't look off camera. <laughs> yeah, it's hard, particularly with two screens. Yeah, it's all good. So it's just the two of us today. And we've got no, no guests. We're, we're doing a few talking heads over the next uh, few months. Just kind of sharing some of our insights and knowledge from projects. And today's topic is on how to build and grow an e-commerce team. Uh, I've had various chats with people over the years, I'm sure you have, Paul, about what's the right way to, to build a team? What skills do you need to have in-house? Which roles do you need to focus and prioritise? Why? Um, and we're going to have a, uh, just an open discussion today, share some of our thoughts and perspectives from the various clients that we've worked with. Um, they, you know, there's no 100% right answer to this. Different businesses, depending on the, the size of business, the stage of their maturity, the market they're in, the investment they got, etc. We'll, we'll have different approaches to this. So we're going to throw a few ideas around, and hopefully this will give people good food for thought. Um, anything you want to add to that, Paul? Does that, does that kind of set the scene nicely enough? No, I think, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah I think that's it. Cool. Um, so that's the scene setting. So let's start off. the. I think one of the key questions is, what roles do you start with? It's always a hard thing, like especially for small businesses starting out, launching an e-commerce channel, trying to grow. What, what roles do you start with when you're a small business with limited resource? And I've always approached this. Um, any conversation I've ever had, either when I was in-house or when I'm talking with clients, is that there are three core pillars for internal control. There's ownership, strategy, and the P&L. Uh, so budgeting, um, forecast, and all of that element of it. And for me, those are the bits that you need to take uh, control of. Ownership's essential because you want to own your uh, e-commerce channel you don't want somebody else to be dictating what's happening with it where it's going what you're focused on you need to know what you're doing why you're doing it and and have that decision making uh, authority which then leads into strategy you need to to set the scene you need to define where you're going Uh, you need to define roadmaps etc what you're trying to achieve what your core goals objectives are and then you need to put the financial controls in place to know what's realistic to spend Uh, yeah are you either doing it from bottom bottom down, um, bottom up, sorry, or top down. So are you starting from targets and working down to what you should spend or are you starting with a fixed budget and working out what you can achieve? You need to have real control of that because you've got to know what you can afford to spend, what co- you know, cost per acquisition is realistic for you, all of those things, which I don't typically recommend get outsourced because knowing those numbers is so important to be able to, to then make smart decisions about who you work with, where you spend your, your investment. So that, that always leads me to say that initially, Businesses need someone who's who's a generalist, who's experienced enough to take control and put a clear structure in place. So they might not have the detail execution, but they know core processes. They know how e-commerce fits in. They know, for example, that e-commerce has touch points across the business with finance, customer services. You know, when planning massive campaigns, it has an impact on on things like demand planning, you know, stock availability. Um, you know, there's supply chain considerations, etc. So someone with broad skills who understands the implication of a decision, even if they're not necessarily the expert at implementing the campaign itself, and they need that strategic strategic vision. And one good example for me has always been promotions. So when you plan a big promotion, say Black Friday, it's no, it's no good just saying, right, well, we've got Black Friday discount on the website. It's up and live. Brilliant. You've got to know, do you have the right stock coverage for that? Do customer service teams have the resource to, to scale up for any additional inquiries, you know, phone, phone orders, for example, queries, issues, additional returns? Uh, have you discussed um, with the warehouse and with the supply chain, do you have the right uh, availability there to be able to get more orders out the door quickly to satisfy your core delivery propositions, et cetera? How are you handling the bulk uh, the spike in returns if you get them? Somebody who's got that strategic oversight is absolutely essential. So that for me is always my starting point. Um, so what's your take for work, when you're talking about the clients you work with? What's the starting point? What roles do they need most? Yeah, I guess um, kind of adding to some of the stuff you've already said, I think if it's a small business, I think the first thing is just knowing what you've already got. So um, we've had a few clients that I think have made mistakes here. And I think they've got, you know, very hands on CEOs, got other people in the business that are quite involved in the e-com channel, in the e-com channel. And then they've brought in an e-com director or someone with a lot of experience, maybe because they're kind of one of their goals is to grow, but they've maybe brought that person in too early. And it's been a bad fit because that person has been out of the day-to-day or out of the trenches um, for the last five years. 
Um, and then it hasn't, that role hasn't worked just because they're not really the right fit for what they actually need. So I think that first piece is just actually figuring out what you need. I tend to recommend to a lot of the brands that we've worked with, uh, hiring a senior e-com manager over a head of e-com quite a lot. So someone that's happy to actually, you know, sit in the platform, kind of take on some of the trading work, take on a lot of the kind of day-to-day reporting, as well as kind of have an ownership over the channel. And then it's easier for that person to then step up and learn new things as opposed to someone then stepping down and they're probably not going to be happy doing all that stuff um, yes it's, it's expensive resource yeah to have doing admin work really yeah absolutely and I actually think that this happens a lot I think people actually want to almost spend a bit more money on that person because e-com is a really important channel particularly if they're not a kind of pure play business and they think by throwing a lot of money at that person it just means that they're going to have a better experience but actually that person's not really like aligned with where they are at that point um, and then I think, I mean, for me, the obvious one to start off with for a relatively small business is bringing in an econ manager, um, ideally that's fairly broad. Uh, maybe they've got like a specialism that's like aligned with the business. So um, we work with a few subscription brands, like for, for those types of businesses, I think they benefit from working with people that have done subscriptions before, ideally, or maybe they've worked with the tech stack in the past or the industry or something like that. Um, but I feel like that kind of econ manager that can, again, then kind of step up is usually quite a good starting point, but it, it does massively depend on the business, doesn't it, really? You see, it depends, Claxon. But I think your, your point about not bringing in someone too senior in too early is really, really important because... For, for a small business, typically, they might have headcount for one or two people. You have to have somebody who's that generous, the, the strategic side, who can who can manage the overall vision and take ownership of that channel. But, yeah, they also need to get their hands dirty. So if you get somebody who doesn't want to do that, who doesn't want to be you know, mucking in when there's a big campaign to launch and getting involved in the platform and helping whoever, you know, say you've got a web admin alongside you, helping them do the campaign setup you know, helping uh, with like big product uploads. It's, it's amazing in, in, in the day-to-day battle when you suddenly got, you know, 500 products to add on, how an e-commerce manager in a small business might end up doing some of that data import work alongside the web admin person. So you've got to have somebody who has the capability who can switch between the two. Um, mm-hmm. So who can go back to the let's plan and make sure we've got an overall strategy and we have processes and, and we're actually working out roadmaps and improvements but we also have the practicality. We've got a day-to-day site to trade and we don't have a team of 20 people. So yeah, I think that's a really important thing. And yeah, that, that, that aligns nicely. Cause a lot that I've spoken to, to smaller clients over the years is when they've had that e-commerce manager in place, that e-commerce manager, because they typically come in at a mid-level, not a senior level, but they're, they're the kind of person who's hands-on, but also is quite ambitious because you want them to have energy and drive and not just somebody who wants a nine to five because there's a lot of different tasks but they yeah. typically then want to move on as in to, to develop their skills, do more and more exciting projects. And if you don't bring a web admin person in at the right point, that person gets pulled more down into the detail, into the weeds, into the day-to-day tasks that aren't that exciting that you would expect the web admin person to be focused on because they're at you know, a more junior level of their, their career. So it's really important to get that balance so you enable the mid person to, to feel job satisfaction and, and be able to drive forward strategic projects rather than constantly spending their time fixing image issues, dealing with internal like uh, bugs and problems. I think um, I think this is quite a generic thing to say, but as with like hiring generally, I do think a lot of it, particularly in like that scenario, comes down to personality, like having someone that, you know, some people might be a lot more happy to get their hands dirty and kind of understand when they need to do it versus when they don't or when they should be doing it versus when they don't. And equally, that last point that you were making about knowing kind of when to push back, knowing when to suggest new hires, you know, how to spend money, how to allocate budget. Like, yeah, I think a lot of it, because obviously experience is, is a huge part of it, but I also think personality is as well. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. Um, the last thing you want is to to bring somebody in in a role where they are so ambitious that within six months that they're going to have outgrown it because there's a time and cost of recruitment and also there's a potential impact if if there's no room for them to go you've got two you've got two issues number one is they might be trying to push for the next person up's job but there's nowhere for that person to go number two they'll go elsewhere so you spent all that money on recruitment and they've got that uh, six months, twelve months expertise, and they just jump ship into a, a you know the next level up for them, which happens a lot because e-commerce is a fast moving recruitment space. Yeah, yeah n- nice point. So it leads me on to to the next discussion point, which is the importance of T-shaped generous. There's a lot of discussion 
um, in the industry around specialising, uh, generalising, the, uh, the mixture of different types of people. So I guess for those who are less less involved in discussion about recruitment, by generalist, I mean somebody who's not a subject matter expert. Like They're not focused on digital marketing. They are have broad skills around e-commerce trading, catalogue management. Um, the, uh, they will know some digital marketing, but that's not what they do day in, day out, versus somebody whose job it is to do is to manage one area of that business, like a, a head of SEO, for example. So what is your, your view on how important a T-shape? Do you think T-shape people are essential in any business? Or do you think, again, it's the it depends thing? I think it definitely depends. Um, and I think we can say that like all the way through this because like all of this does depend. But I think these people are super valuable. But often, I guess, again, it depends on the size of the business, the level of the business, like the important, the channel, everything else. I think these, like, candidates are fantastic um i know a few people that would definitely like fit this category and they've kind of got maybe started off in kind of broader or like a big econ company picked up the trade inside the kind of overall kind of multi-channel kind of aspects all of that kind of the fundamentals of econ and then they've maybe moved into smaller companies focused a bit more on digital marketing reporting all of that stuff and then they've kind of come out of it as being a really strong kind of t-shaped person um i think that they like it's almost the holy grail for a lot of brands the only thing is is in some businesses particularly if it's a small team um you probably do want some or not necessarily i guess but i think there are certain scenarios where you want people that have had specialisms maybe or like you know you bring someone in for a certain type of business or a certain type of brand and you want them to have a really strong trading background um and equally you know there might be some businesses where the the kind of biggest challenge is kind of scaling the um, the demand and acquisition side. And on that side, you might want someone that's kind of a bit more specialist with digital marketing. But but I do, I mean, I think there's there's almost no argument that these people are like super valuable. And particularly if they're in kind of that senior e-com manager, head of e-com level, um, kind of being able to add value across the board. Um, yeah, yeah, I think it does. I mean, my, my view is always like, I feel like I'm quite pro- this type of candidate with a good attitude that's quite scrappy wants to get something i mean there's pros and cons and again it depends on the rest of the team um but i personally like working with people that are like this and kind of willing and able to get stuff done and able to kind of accelerate things so i think for me it's again yeah it comes to the the, the stage of growth of that business and who owns e-commerce because in some businesses the head of marketing owns e-commerce because it's a very small business and they don't have an e-commerce function, but they have a web admin person. And that actually works well because the marketing head has got the wider perspective around acquisition, retention, et cetera. They might not be an e-commerce specialist, but the web admin person is keeping the website going. And that makes sense because they're focused on raising the brand, driving traffic, keeping customers happy, et cetera. At some point, though, when when you need to to create a, a standalone e-commerce function headed by an e-commerce lead, this is to me where the T-shaped person comes in. That's when it's it, it, not the director level, come back to your original point, it's a head of, S, head of e-commerce or an e-commerce manager. Because they complement a web admin or a web executive, whatever you want to call that 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 role, really nicely. Because they then help that person by representing e-commerce across the business of understanding how they need to be supported by other parts of the business to get things executed and give that person the support, so they're not always just being shouted at by loads of different departments to get stuff done. Because they can be the the, the conduit for for prioritisation. So right. I think being at different points of maturity and coming back to your point about depending on you know what's driving the business. Often you find when uh, smaller businesses suddenly get investment, that might be it's an owner run, a great business, great idea, great product, it's pure play, and all of a sudden they they get turned to an investment and the investment team wants to ramp up the pace of growth. You can't do that effectively, I don't think, and I've not seen it, without a a T-shaped person in place who is able to work across the business because otherwise you get all these silos creeping in and inefficiency, processes break down, customer expectations aren't good, customer experience yeah, you, know, you might be able to deliver something good on the website, but then it breaks down on other parts of business because the SLAs aren't there and people aren't supporting your plans. So I think it's really important to think about where you are in your growth and align it at that point. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think um, it's quite interesting. Um, I, I keep coming back to, do you remember we had Lewis from Loaf on this, on the podcast a while back and, and he uh, spoke at our like, mini internal event recently. And I think his role is a really interesting one because I would put him into this category of like, he's got a lot, he's got quite broad experience. He's now essentially like 
a senior BA or like innovation lead at Loaf. So he's got a really interesting role where he's essentially just almost like defining, going around to all the different stakeholders, defining the roadmap, and then yeah. he's responsible for delivering it and kind of making key decisions around vendors and everything else. Um, and I think that's probably a good example of like almost like the best possible role for this type of person. But then you've probably still, I'd imagine they've still got someone um, at a senior level that's responsible for sales and the commercial side, um, you know, and is solely kind of looking at that side. And they've probably been doing that for a number of years. And I think with this role, and again, like, you know, I, I'm thinking like from in my head based on my client, um, but I almost feel like, um, you want this is probably like you say like a head of ecom and then you for a bigger brand you've probably got an ecom director or a vp of ecom or whatever else who's more or entirely focused on like commercial and like some of the bigger business issues around like logistics and operations and that kind of stuff yeah and i find this interesting because my background is is generalist you know i have i guess pockets of expertise that are deeper in some areas than others but i find it i find this an interesting trade because i've been doing a project recently on replatforming where that's why I've been brought in because of that ability to think across the business and say, you're making one decision on e-commerce here, but it's going to impact these things. And these are the elements to think about. So especially with technology selection um, and integration of other, other um, platforms, just get people to think about the true impact and, and what it will be like when they've made that decision and the impact on their operational capabilities. Then as they brought in, a senior e-commerce manager that has been transitioned as you would hope to so that 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 role and that decision making is then managed in-house and the role of the consultant drops off because it's not needed Uh, and that's one of the I guess it's one of the ironic things of my work is I always tell people that's where they should get to internally you should be less dependent on a consultant like me and more in control of that that cross-functional vision and strategy because that's in your best interest in the long term. I think that takes us on to the next question, which is like where and when you start to um, take stuff in house. I guess. Yeah, um, I, I do you know. I, I cheekily reached out to a few people on on Twitter beforehand just to get other people's perspective. So I'm going to read out a few quotes, and that will frame our discussion. So interesting one from from Jerry White, who heads up um, is the SEO director at Rise at Seven. He said he was recently talking to Nick Wilson about. It. So Nick used to head up. The, the search program for Vodafone. So he's got a lot of experience working at a massive organisation. Um, and their, their view is that the leadership has to come from within, but the the kind of the grunt work, the dog work um, uh, can be external. So if you have that vision strategy, come back to our original point, then it's easier to outsource that because you know what you're outsourcing and you can put better briefs together, better specs, select the right people to deliver and you can manage and evaluate it because you know what, it, what you're trying to achieve. Um, and a couple of examples that Nick gave was like digital PR should be external. It's not something typically you build external capability of, but tech SEO should be inside. And that aligns with a few other people as well. So, for example, Peter Mindenall, who's an in-house um, SEO lead, said that always oh, keeping SEO in-house is sensible and having one person leading the strategy. So there's a lot of similar comments about some functional areas such as SEO that should be owned in-house and then general strategy and leadership as well. Yeah, I think um, I think this is really interesting. This whole session, I feel like we could talk about this for days and the interesting thing as well, and obviously all of those inputs are really good. I think it's interesting. You work, you would typically work for a bigger business than I would work with. And I think it's quite interesting as to how it would probably differ. Like, I feel like um, the average team of my clients is usually very similar which would usually be like dependent on the brand and the importance of e-com and might have an e-com director, which is who reports into the board. If not, they're typically be a head of e-com, e-com manager or trading manager, digital marketing manager, CRM manager or exec, e-com exec, merchandisers. And I feel like that's almost identical across the types of, or not almost identical, but it's very similar across a lot of types of clients that I work with, which is typically like a brand, I guess, like a, maybe a 10 million pound brand. Um, and I think it's interesting when like it, the conversation is almost quite different when you're talking about bigger companies, um, where there's generally a lot more people, there's a lot more stakeholder management. There's a lot of stuff to work on beyond just kind of that like objective for smaller brands. Uh, yeah. I, it's horses to course, isn't it? It, it? And we'll come on to like, how do you manage it as you scale and how do those structures change? I, I find it. I find it interesting as of about 2015, 2016, how more of the larger clients I've worked with have moved towards cross-functional teams rather than 
we have e-commerce, we have marketing, we have trading, and we have our structures within trading. And then we have matrices of how we need to work together on campaigns and planning to then building stuff around um, categories. So I saw this at House of Fraser, and it was a real. I, I thought this was really good. They they, they did an in, they did a consultancy piece of work with an external specialist. Um, I think it was Practicology actually who did that piece of work with them, um, and uh, and the, the, looked at all the current processes, challenges, issues, opportunities, and came up with with those kind of it's essentially hubs where you, you know, women's wear, for example, then has has buyers, traders, yeah. um, SEOs. Um, digital marketers, uh, you know, web, web trader, you name it, UX, etc. So those people within still sit in their own depart- department. So the SEO for women's wear still sits within the SEO team, so that there is an overall SEO structure and strategy and framework. But they are part of that hub, that hub team working on that category, and therefore you've got this 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 uh, cross functional um, pollination and people working better as a team to plan up and down. Of the chain i think that's that for me when you've got a complex product catalog a com, uh, larger business a global business can be quite effective and again i think this is where our uh not experience is different because i know you work with a lot of the types of businesses i work with as well but i haven't done too much uh in, with like those kind of larger multi-brand uh mm-hmm. businesses it's usually like a single brand um that i would usually work with and it's yeah it's interesting to see how different they are um, I think going back to this original question, I think the interesting trend that I've seen recently is what roles people are pulling in house. Um, so a lot of these brands, and at the moment it feels like a lot of the clients we work with, and probably a lot of the clients you work with, have uh, have raised money, or they've got quite a lot of money behind them, or they're suddenly investing a lot more money in ecom, and they want to accelerate a lot faster than they might have done three years ago. Um, and it feels like, you know, probably a third of our clients have built in-house development teams over the last, or our bigger clients at least, uh, over the last 18 months. And they've kind of hired that technical lead, potentially a product owner, potentially a BA, which is an interesting trend that I've seen um, with more people kind of bringing in that BA to do like, to make better decisions and to kind of run projects more effectively. Um, and then they've hired developers um and i think that's quite an interesting trend i think the digital marketing team as well like a lot of the these brands that are looking to grow quickly um are hiring particularly some of the paid roles in-house so be it they're building their own paid teams or they're just hiring a performance market manager with a pretty uh, good paid background as they look to like scale um search social um you know and, and also for a lot of these brands like all their kind of brand awareness activity is like geared around social in particular. And I think, you know, having a, a really strong in-house capability around creative, around the kind of, yeah, day-to-day execution, fighting for more budget, justification, all of that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. And then CRM is another one. I think there was a point recently where like seven of our clients were hiring a CRM manager um, and it just feels like everyone's just trying to increase or like the amount of resource they're putting into all these channels and just, you know, they've all got really aggressive targets and they're maybe like refocusing the business and focusing entirely on econ. Um, but I do think this is a very interesting trend at the moment. Yeah, I do. I, I have to say the, the the internal development stuff, it, it suits some businesses more than others. I think when you when you have a really dynamic business that's constantly changing, like open up new channels where it's 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 deploying stuff. Um, to the site really, really quickly. It's reacting to, to to trends far far quicker than others. I think I think when you've got that constant like regular, regular iterative releasing, lots and lots of drops and far, fast fashion is a good example. Of that. I can see the benefit of of building up your, especially the front end engineering capability, because you can just be a bit more dynamic in how you do things without having to to do the briefing in process and agency. But you've got the challenge of of the environment set up. The um, deployment flows if you're still using agency for the core application, and, that, and we know, we both know that's not to be taken on lightly. That 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 you need a real senior engineer who's got that process knowledge and, and environment managed knowledge to get that right. Otherwise, you create you just push mess further down the line. And I, I've I've seen one client recently who went down that route. They built up and they're incurring a lot of cost. I mean, we're talking about you know, 100k a month in in, in development costs. And now they're stripping it all out to go back to focus on just using the agency because the efficiency wasn't there. Um, so I, I think, yeah, I think it's, it suits some businesses better than others. 
and business like you know John Lewis that moved to commerce tools, they have a depth of engineering development capability, both from architectural point of view down to all the different levels of engineer and developers to be able to do it, which has taken them a long time to build up and get the right people in the house and get the right structure and organization. The biggest challenge of this is if your business is suddenly says, oh, I want to build up an engineering function, good luck finding the senior engineers and senior devs, especially senior front-end devs. How competitive is it, mate? There's, yeah, at the minute, it's insane. I think all like recruitment across the board is the biggest challenge for pretty much anyone I talk to. Um, I think there's massive pros and cons to it. And also the other, so we keep saying it depends, but the big variable as well is the technology stack. Like I think, you know, there's a lot, a lot of the brands that I'm talking about that have maybe done this. They've bought in, they've managed to find the technical lead. They've kind of built out, yeah, the deployment processes, documentation processes, you know, a bit of a plan. Um, and they've kind of put those foundations in place, but they're working with Shopify. And maybe, you know, they've got kind of um, a pretty standard business, standard ERP. You know, they've got like a bit of a plan for the integration. But then it's a case of they're spending 20 grand a month with an agency on a retainer that's entirely kind of front end work. And they're just bringing that kind of front end in. And I think, but I do think there's pros and cons. If it, if you're working with a platform like Magento, I think building an in-house team is a lot harder. I think there's a lot more risk to it as well. Um, and I think, um, and I think, yeah, it ultimately, like it does come down to. Like I think there's there is a lot of risk to take it in house, but there's a lot of gain for the right business if they've got the right people in place. I think for the bigger businesses, as you just said realistically you probably want like a cto or someone like um really senior that's kind of building out that kind of technology program um and then with the smaller businesses you just need to be confident that you've got the team in place that can you know keep people and actually build something to a good standard and build the right kind of quality gates and everything else and all the processes because i think what you do see as you just said as well and that's a bigger business still i'd imagine but um you see a lot of businesses take it in house and actually they just you know the quality of their theme goes down massively they don't have any documentation any process oh yeah documentation and here's the big question right it because this costs money to, to get even if you're a smallest business and you're going to have a front end maybe three like a a, a lead a senior front end and a, a mid junior front end you're still talking uh, over 200 grand's worth of cost per year yeah, potentially, or two hundred grand a year cost. The question then becomes: is that is that is that better spent where you actually spend less than that, but with an agency to to manage and deploy, and you put more of that into customer acquisition or customer experience or strategic projects? It's really important. I think this is one of the biggest challenges when you grow: is where's your money best spent? What yeah. is your differentiator? What's going to get you to your growth point? Um, so let, let's talk about some other roles because. Yeah, the development one we could talk about forever. I mean, absolutely. Yeah. Podcast on he- headless, where that opens up new discussions as well. But so the specialist roles that that I've seen work well, and coming back to when I was head of e-commerce, and then through with clients I work with, is is wanting a, a, a senior SEO or a tech SEO lead because the SEO, no matter how important um, uh, you know digital marketing is for lots of business, and where most of the acquisition comes through digital marketing channels and not through organic. In terms of, of core performance, the keep an eye on the accessibility bit, the, the speed and making sure that, that you're indexable and you're visible um, and you you have that reassurance is really, really important because it, things change all the time. Right? You know, the, the latest one in the last week with, with people just um, decry, um, decrying the fact that, that Google's rewriting title tags and suddenly their, their, um, their visibility is dropping, their click-through rates dropping and you, having somebody who who is able to be on top of that and know it and help help you guide you through that, it feels important as you grow. Yeah, I think um, with that one as well, I feel like it's a really good role to have in house. But I think again, it de- it depends on the type of business. Like um, one of my friends recruited someone recently for a, a, like a very heavy content site that had like a bit of an econ channel, and I think that was and they hired a head of SEO and then an SEO manager perfectly great example of where that would add shed loads of value you know they'd have a lot more resource in place that within the business there'd be a lot more focus on it um but and equally you know i do every now and then i see like brands bring in an seo manager for the sake of it and actually don't really know why they need that in-house they don't really know what their day-to-day should look like they don't really have any goals it's more just they want to 
build an in-house digital marketing team. Um, but I do agree. And I think the same principle now, I think as much as it's obviously not good for us, like we run, I run a paid media agency. I personally think taking paid in-house can be really valuable. And again, for the right brand with the right goals, with the right team, a clear outline of what they should, why they're doing it. Um, I yeah, that's a good point actually about a brand because it, it, if, if most of your organic search is brand and it's not yeah. generic and long tail, then yeah. Like a fashion yeah. brand. Yeah, exactly. So you could you could have your Cooltech SEO done through your agency partner to make sure that you've got all your accessibility and performance and speed sorted. And then yeah, yeah digital marketing makes way more sense from an acquisition and 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 um, LTV point of view. And and even with the paid side, you know, if you're spending half a million pound on paid, which these days a lot of brands are, just because you know they've got the view that they can make it work, and you know, and it helps to you know achieve the numbers that they have to hit. Um, I think even if you've got someone in house and you still use an agency, often it, you know, that person actually being internal and being able to push the creative team to actually, you know, like push the boundaries, you know, give them more assets to test, you know, push the agency a bit harder, you know, push reporting, all of those kind of business aspects behind running paid. I think that's a valuable kind of usually what, yeah, kind of that's usually a very valuable hire. A hundred percent, because we all know, I mean, there's a lot of incredibly good agencies and freelancers out there doing a wonderful job, but there's also a, a, a lot of inefficiency in, in, in agency world where people are just spending money and it's not necessarily optimised. The campaigns have got, uh, you know, dead wood in there. Um, you know, there, there's cost for acquisitions that are high and they should be. There's yeah. bidding that shouldn't be happening and it's, it's leaking um, uh, campaign funds away. And so you have to have somebody in-house who's not not doing the whip bit because it should be yeah. a somebody who, who's setting, who, there's the strategy thing and leadership, who's defining the parameters and the goals and who's also a conduit for that agency because agencies need support from clients to get yeah. assets, to get information, to understand where the product strategy and the, the growth strategy is going. And if you don't have that, you, you do get a lot of inefficiency at yeah. times. There's been a couple of times where we've um, worked with a client and they've hired someone internally. And obviously we're semi-threatened by the fact they've hired a paid person internally. But actually, and like, you know, on our side, numbers look great. Teams focusing on what's working you know like where the kind of ROAS is but actually someone's come in and they've given our team a much better handle on you know where they actually already have coverage where they're going to sell out anyway um, yeah. you know inventory all of that kind of stuff when new products come in like yeah like you say just actually having like a proper handle on the strategy and been because I think yeah I mean that's another episode we should do agency management because I actually think that's that's a big topic and a lot of people that makes a massive difference to performance Oh, 100 percent. And that point you said about, you know, the, the, the these uh, things like stock coverage and, and product strategy is so important because you even get elements where where an agency's doing it all and they don't have a an owner for digital marketing in-house. And the agency have been saying for months, we need a improved data feed, we need better integration with with stock systems to be able to get outages so that we can change our campaign bidding and pause, suspend, automate that process because you're basically you're losing money by not doing this. And then internally, it's not prioritised because there's nobody internally who understands what that's going to do and has put an ROI case to it. And all of a sudden, it gets flipped because that owner is fighting the case of the agency and they're working together to create that roadmap of, of actions. Yeah. Another one, it kind of touches on a point that you said earlier about the, the content side. And for me, for businesses where content is a massive part of their strategy, whether it's about engaging and keeping people on the site or keeping them back to the site or it's con content commerce to drive sales through content marketing, um, that's some area where I've seen people build out content teams internally. And typically it starts with something Often it starts. It's often it doesn't start on this uh, this side of things with a strategy. It starts with so, uh, someone like a copywriter, because getting on brand content and consistent copy across a site, whether it's in marketing content, landing pages, product stuff, it's really really hard. Like everyone can write copy, but very few can write it well. Yeah, absolutely. And I think this is this is. So I completely agree with that point. Uh, and I think content teams like I used to work bulletproof. 
and um they they their blog was massive for them like on not you didn't necessarily realize it but actually like a huge amount of their demand came from their blog and it they got a huge amount of traffic and they started to build out some really interesting roles like you know they hired an seo analyst like an seo manager like various other roles that were geared around essentially the understanding trends like consumer behavior everything else and and it was really valuable. I think one thing that you've just said that I've spoke to quite a few people about recently that I think is really important as well is, and it does depend, but I think creative is another one that's quite interesting. And obviously if you're a brand, there's a good chance you've got a creative director that's kind of built out brand guidelines, digital brand guidelines. They govern kind of, you know, the front end of the site because it's a huge part of their brand. Um, but there's also a lot of businesses that have grown quickly that haven't uh, got that kind of brand focus. So we work with a couple of businesses, one like huge volume, multi-brand. Um, and I think uh, their site, you know, performed really well. They've invested a lot of money in CRO. They've invested a lot of money in acquisition. You know, they've got um, a really good agency. They spend a lot of money on functionality, but it doesn't feel like it's not a consistent kind of brand experience. And I actually feel like it's quite hard to quantify um, but I actually think that's something they're really missing. And it doesn't, you know, when you like go through the site, it just feels disjointed and you almost, they need to kind of, I think, push other areas to like instill that trust just because it it just doesn't feel like a great experience. And I actually think that's an interesting one as well. Um, and then equally on the same lines, talking a bit about what we've already talked about with paid, with these D to C brands that, you know, are trying to build the most engaging site imaginable and throw as much traffic as humanly possible at it and just try and convert it as high as possible. Um, I think in-house creative as well uh, is a huge part of that. And actually having like a proper roadmap around what you're creating, making sure that you're building the assets for all of the different channels, for CRM, for paid, for on-site and testing properly and everything else. Um, I do think that's an interesting one that a lot of people are now starting to invest more money in. Yeah, it's an interesting one. I, a lot of brand-led businesses I work with, they they build out a creative function with a, a creative director. Um, uh, uh, that work and that's somebody who's got a skill across channels they're not just unique to eco I guess it depends if you're a pure pure play then you don't need that yeah. you need someone who's got specifically got digital skills one of the big challenges here though is some traditional businesses that, that have grown out of uh, uh, build up a creative team lack um, e-commerce and digital creative experience and it can lead to mismatches in terms of when you're looking at user experience because the you find in some brands creative tend to influence a decision more than other people because that's a very strong part of the business and they normally have like the owners or the board's ear and that can be a real real balance to try and work out because if they don't have a digital person in their team they can produce beautiful aesthetics but they fit in the physical and the print world well far better and they don't necessarily work especially in like smaller devices like mobile i've seen this on a, on a big brand where the designs that were signed off were just they weren't e-commerce friendly and then there was a lot of optimization work had to work had to happen afterwards to bring those designs back into an e-commerce ux framework that would work and, and would actually get shoppers to use it and click and buy so there, there is definitely a challenge with building internal creative skills in an e-commerce environment yeah absolutely and i think again that's another topic we could talk about a lot like um I, I know we've both done quite a lot in luxury fashion and then you know half the time you've got the ceo is the creative director and they've got a very strong opinion and you know brand comes first and i think um yeah that's one of the most challenging parts sometimes to running a re-platform budget or like a redesign or kind of yeah an overhaul or like a transformation project in ecom um i think we're gonna do we're obviously gonna talk to diego soon who works for totem he's worked for a lot of luxury fashion brand and uh he's he's really good at managing that side of things or like at least inputting and justifying and um yeah just having kind of a process going into a project with that i think that would be an interesting discussion yeah it is the the, the one other role that i i think is really important as well in-house is um data analysis so again a small business growing will be very different to a big business that wants to build out a data science function where they 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 kind of you know have all of the skill set across the analysis points from you know um, user experience research and analysts to true data science to um, data analysts um, e-commerce data analysts web analysts etc. For me, the key one for an e-commerce team is that that web analyst, and it's not just somebody who generates reports. Any anyone can create a report, 
no disrespect to people whose role it is. We all have to do it. But there's a massive difference between reporting and analysis. So somebody who understands day, the data principles of taking data and using it to help answer questions or being able to identify issues or opportunities through data and generate, translate that into insights so that a report goes from we went up 10% to we went up 10% because of A, B and C and we should do more of C because this is the opportunity for us. Having that skill as you grow is so important because otherwise what happens is so much money starts getting spent, loads of features get added to a site and even though the revenue is going up, maybe the profitability, there's no clear understanding of exactly why and where the inefficiencies are. And you bury so much inefficiency if you don't have good analysis. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I agree. I think um, some of our clients that have had them maybe haven't have struggled to get the most out of them. And they sit in between teams and it's almost like a battle for their time. Um, but I do completely agree that that skill set is very valuable. Yeah, and it's hard, it's hard to get them because... Often when I see job specs, and it's, we want a web analyst, the job spec is about a somebody who reports, so somebody who goes into GA and takes data yeah. out and shares it around the business. It's not a web analyst. Yeah, it's an analyst. Yeah, exactly. A true web analyst will be bored senseless if all they do is generate reports yeah. or if all they do is customise GA to give additional data for people. Yes, that's part of the role, but you need, you need, some, you need to be able to get somebody tangible projects that says, Okay, our our um our ROI from you know digital marketing is X. We want to find opportunities where we're we're underperforming, overperforming, and here's the four questions we want to answer. Go and use our data and go and tell us do we have the right data? Do we need to improve tracking functionality? Do we need to set up new data tools to do this? Come up and tell us how we can answer this and, and get the uh, and you know get some resolution. I remember um, a funny story, well, quite a funny story from earlier in my uh, career. So it must have been like eight years ago. And I was doing some freelance work for a brand and they had a really good analyst. And I was working with the digital marketing team. We were trying to fix a load of um, tracking issues. And we we're trying to work with this analyst. And I was like, this guy is rubbish. <laughs> like He's terrible at his job. He doesn't understand like GA and everything else. But I just had no view of like what his role was. And actually, and neither did the digital market team internally. Like, yeah. I don't understand how this guy like wasn't a GA expert but actually he was more what you're talking about where he's drawing trends on you know inventory and you know yes. yeah buying and everything else um but yeah it's funny that funny looking uh, back and unfortunately I've seen too many recruitment processes where people don't really know what role they want the job spec isn't very well defined and therefore the candidates they bring in they're not questioning in the right ways it's it's, it's really hard. It's a real art form to do recruitment well, to, to nail down exactly what the job is. Uh, and if you're not quite sure, to create it with enough structure so that you don't get someone totally irrelevant. Uh, often, you, you, you made the point earlier about culture and personality. That's as important as anything. And you, you know, you, if, if there's a business where people want a web analyst, but they don't really know what to do with them, if you get somebody who's only used to working in a very a prescriptive role where they have to have their everything that they need to defined for them, that won't work. If you've got somebody who's brilliant at going in and making sense of chaos and has got is not perturbed by that and is doesn't panic, then you've got somebody who can go in and add value because they'll bring that structure in. Yeah, absolutely. And I think structure and organization is another one that um quite hard to like I guess it's just something that's really important because I think a lot of our the people we work with have very little structure. They're not very organized. You know, they've grown really quickly. And then suddenly they've got to a point where they need to try and scale the business and they'll bring in someone senior and actually they'll spend their first six months actually putting that structure in. And I do think it's certainly not my area. I'd imagine it'd be a lot more your area, but I do think um, all of that stuff is really important. Basically, you're saying I'm dull. No, well, you're very good at all of that. Kind of thing. I think the, the other one... Uh, very dull that is related to some of the stuff that you've just mentioned is um that whole like racy piece and kind of yeah. understanding that and like who is accountable you know who is responsible like, all of that kind of stuff and again that's way more your area than my area but i think um i see that coming to play a lot more now and i think it's it's actually really important for like all businesses to understand that it's fun to be at the raci mate um, I, I agree because actually when people don't understand structure, a really good way of doing it is it, I've done this on a replatform project is what are the what are the roles uh, and tasks that we need to satisfy? And you map them out and then you say, okay, so who who's doing that at the moment? 
And then you suddenly realise that there's gaps and you can you can very quickly help them identify the type of person they've got a gap for. Or you you turn you basically do it the other way and say, right, okay, you don't know who's meant to be doing what. Right, projects typically need a PM, a BA, a da 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 This is the role and responsibility of each of those. Who would fit in this? Do you have someone? And then you do the gaps that way. So different ways of doing it. Um, this leads me on to a question. How do you complement internal with external? um skills and to keep happy culture because bringing in too many externals can make people internally feel not valued or it can tread on people's toes or you might or not bringing people in means you might not have the right skills coverage and i, I typically say you pay for specialist skills you don't have and they're going to uh, complement you and you bring in people where there is a role that's clearly needed but you can't justify a full-time five days a week um uh, job because it's not that um, you know, and it's there to augment existing knowledge. So what, what's your take on What's your advice on how you complement an internal team and an external? Yeah, so I mean, I personally like uh, clients having, I guess, good, strong external partners on retainer. Um, and obviously, because, you, you know, a lot of people bring in contractors, do fixed scope projects, everything else. But I think, um, so like we've got one client who's got, essentially like a, a very good web analyst on a four day a month retainer and they're kind of part of the team ish they you know they take on certain responsibilities they're not accountable for anything because they're essentially a contractor um but it's a skill that they'd be very unlikely to have in-house um and they've got a similar uh piece with like a, a digital creative designer um yeah and i think that there's so many specialist skill sets out there that you're going to really struggle to be able to afford, you know, a ridiculously high salary that you can you can pull in a really specialist person. And I think it, obviously it doesn't have to be on retainer. There'll be times where you need people for projects, times where you've got a specific deliverable. Um, but I quite often will recommend to our clients, like one that we've talked about SEO a little bit. I'm quite pro SEO contractors because they're a little bit more invested. You know, you've got a single person that's very senior that can have a certain level of conversation. Um, you know, they're kind of maybe a little bit more part of the team, able to build internal process. It was easier to build internal processes. Maybe it's slightly easier to kind of deviate away from the normal agency kind of processes and the ways of working. And I think it's, it's kind of like a big part of SEO for me. And again, this is all most of our clients are brands, um, is kind of building that SEO culture. And I think, for brands, again, it's quite hard to justify bringing in a head of SEO or a senior SEO manager. But I do think the contractor route can actually work really well. Obviously, agency can as well. But I do think, yeah, that is a good kind of discipline that you can apply across a few areas. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I always say to people, it's like, what, what do you want? Like, what's missing? Or what's, what's the need? Because if you, if you start with that, you can quickly work out whether it's, it needs somebody internal or external. So if you suddenly realise that, you've got nobody to, to organize and plan and manage your e-commerce channel and all your uh, external partners you need somebody in-house right that's the e-commerce manager role and yes you could get a contract i mean I, i've worked with clients where i've helped them find contractors because they've there's they don't have candidates that you can find they need that role and it needs fucking urgently they bring someone in on like a six-month contract with a view that once they've recruited, that will be a, a succession and handover, which makes sense. Contract is a nice way of, of plugging recent scats. Um, but it's also, it's, it's helping. I, I'd find this external can be really useful to helping internal people. You might have somebody who's an e-commerce manager, but they, they, only have, ha, they only have a few years' experience, so they don't have knowledge across all of the different elements of e-commerce. And maybe they've been asked to do something that's out of their comfort zone, and they don't know how to go about it. Now, if they've got the time to go ahead and like research it to the nth degree, but generally when people have got day-to-day jobs and BAU challenges, you don't. You've literally got to get on and crack on. So sometimes bringing in a freelancer or a contractor for a specific project, like you said, to help that person to basically, it's almost like mentoring, to bring them up to speed, help them make decisions quicker than they would if they had to do it all off their own back. So that, that knowledge then goes to the internal person. So the company now has that knowledge internally that they didn't have before. You've got this brilliant skills transfer. You're paying for the skill transfer, basically, rather than you, consultant, do X and then just dump it on us and leave. But actually, no, you're training the person up to, to be able to do this in future for us. Yeah, I completely agree. And that's kind of what I was getting out of that SEO contractor piece I feel like the contractor is much easier to say to them here's a bespoke brief to like upskill our whole team train our kind of e-com execs and merchandisers build out documentation and process than it would be to go to an agency yes 
Yeah, agreed. And it's nice because you get the one-on-one relationship. A contractor becomes part of the team rather than a service provider. And there is, a, I, I definitely think people respond slightly differently uh, in, in that respect. It, it's weird, us humans, we're strange in how we emotionally respond depending on what somebody's remit is. Um, yeah, and I think um, I think the key thing for, for me as well is is educating internal teams on the re- the reasons and the value of using external people. There's nothing worse if you're in a role and somebody dumps a consultant on you or an agency and says, "Oh, we're we're, we're now working with this agency. Can you now sort this out of them?" And you've had no involvement, you had no stake in it, you haven't been able to influence that decision, and it can become very jarring. What What's your advice to people on how you you kind of you bring external people in and, and get the internal teams on board? Yeah, I mean that's a good it's a good question. Um, and again, I guess it, I guess it depends. I think also, I think that that's, that's kind of like a process where, you know, it's, it's a communication thing, I guess. And it's kind of that person that's bringing them in, making sure they're kind of over communicating and justifying the role of the consultant, et cetera. And then allowing that consultant to like prove themselves. Um, but also on the flip side, I think, so like it's been a few times where I've worked with clients for a period of time and they've basically somehow got a completely new team and they've got, you know, a new e-com director, or a new head of e-com. And actually, I think it's important for them to almost like have room to build out their own kind of team and like set of service providers. And I've kind of like almost like bowed out a little bit um, because I think that as a consultant, it's never a good, it's not the worst situation for me. And I'm sure you feel exactly the same as when you're working with a client, new team comes in and actually, you know, there's not necessarily a need for you or, you know, they're, they're gradually building out that in, in-house capability um, and you're just kind of there or like, you know, the work you're, there's less work for you to actually do, or there's less kind of, um, um, I guess like investment from the internal team around the work you're doing. Um, so I think that's another benefit of using an external uh, kind of agency or contractor sometimes is where it kind of allows you to be a bit more flexible. Yeah, yeah, I think that's. I think flexibility is the key here. It's it's not not tying yourself into something that that might not be right for you in the long term. So contracts are quite nice because it it also gives whether it's contracting a a, you know, a freelancer, bringing the consultancy just. Doing something where you can evaluate somebody. Uh, a lot of the projects I've worked with where people are, have, are not used to big projects, I've said to them, well, let's just do a small mini project, one simple thing for a few days. And that gives you a chance to evaluate whether I fit in with your team or not. And it's a nice way of, of people not feeling like they've overcommitted because there's nothing worse than being stuck on a contractual retainer you can't get out of hemorrhaging money per month with a relationship that's not working. It's not, it's not in anyone's interest. Yeah, 100%. And well, you know, most most agencies and service providers these days are, are 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 very good at how they cut things up, but there are still some unscrupulous people out there who will, will put you into that. Excellent. Um, well, I know we could carry on chatting all day, but I think we'd send people to sleep. Um, so I guess we can let let's stop there. And if anyone's got any questions, do get in, in contact because it's. It's a fascinating topic. There's no, there's no right answer to this, but you know, hopefully we're giving you some good insights on you know the roles you start with as a small business and what's important you grow, the value of a T-shaped generous in a business, what roles to have in-house versus outsource, what specialist roles, etc., and how you complement internal skill with external. Um, so, Paul, any parting comment for people? I don't think so. My only comment as someone that is not very good at recruitment and currently spending a long time on it. Um, I still think that personality thing is really important. And I'm just trying to hire like ridiculous, like just smart people. And sometimes they might have less experience. Sometimes you might have to create a different role for them, but that would be the only other thing I would add. Yeah, I agree. Culture, personality, all that is essential. It's easy to bring people in. It's hard to bring the right people. So yeah, my, my, my point would be so similar to yours, which is be very, very clear about what you need because if you know what you need, you can align a role with it. If you don't really know what you need and you're just effectively pissing in the wind, which is a dangerous place to be when recruiting internally or bringing an external agency partner in. Um, so I hope that was useful. Thanks for listening as always. Keep an ear out for our next episodes. And please do subscribe if you haven't already. And we would also love ratings on Apple or Spotify. It really helps us nudge up our visibility and reach. So that would be much appreciated. Thank you. For more
more information on this topic, head over to replatform.fm for our audio podcasts. To discuss a project, or if you'd like to chat about any of the topics covered in this episode in more detail, please reach out to myself, James Gerd, or my co-host, Paul Rogers, via LinkedIn and Twitter. Thanks again for listening, and keep your ears peeled for the next episode.